Within three months, the number of dead sea otters had quadrupled. Once a strictly protected species, a symbol of recovery after decades of hunting, they now washed ashore like silent witnesses to a terrible mistake. More than half showed the same internal signs. Their cells had begun to break down, as if their bodies were quietly melting from within. Scientists called it autolytic decay, the byproduct of a so-called harmless ocean cleanup project. The sea was being saved by technology, but the cost was the death of the very creatures it once sheltered. If what was released to save the ocean could somehow make its way back into the human food chain, then who was truly in danger? And if green projects could still leave the ocean dying, what's really left out there for us to trust as safe? In the end, what did America release into the sea? A savior or a seed of disaster returning to us? Let's find out. One. The silent killer from the city. Picture a calm morning in California. The ocean lies flat like glass, a thin fog drifting across Monterey Bay, sea otters floating lazily, wrapped in kelp. They were once the face of recovery, a species saved from extinction through millions of dollars and decades of conservation work. People used to say, if the otters are back, it means the ocean is healing. But they never knew that in that same moment of peace, what was killing them had already begun to spread. It wasn't oil. It wasn't chemicals, it came from the safest places we know the city, the hospitals, the kitchens, and the wastewater systems we've trusted for generations. In 2023, scientists at UC Davis made a chilling discovery. Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite from cat feces, was killing sea otters in massive numbers. They called it the silent killer. No color, no odor, no trace. It traveled through pipes, across miles of sewers, and eventually spilled into the Pacific, the very place that was it's supposed to be America's purest natural refuge. Think about it, one sink full of dishwater, one winter storm, one modern treatment plant together forming a kind of biological weapon no one ever meant to create. Every year, billions of gallons of treated wastewater are released into the ocean. But those standards don't measure microbes. They don't count parasites. They don't see what slips through the filters and into the bodies of the smallest, weakest creatures in the food chain. An infrastructure engineer in Oregon once said, our job is to make the water clean for people, not for the ocean. It sounds reasonable, yet it's also the confession of an entire system. The sea otter, considered an ecological indicator species, became living proof of a harsh truth. They were dying because we had become too clean. While humans washed away their own pollution, nature was left to absorb what remained. A single otter, weighing less than 45 pounds, can carry millions of parasite spores inside its body. For humans, that parasite may cause a mild fever. For them, it's a death sentence. Ecologists in Santa Cruz once compared it this way. If humans are the rain, the otters are the last drop that breaks the ocean's balance. The story unfolds like a backward experiment. We saved them by law, but killed them through convenience. Hundreds of kelp restoration and habitat protection projects were praised in the press. While beneath the surface, the parasites spread through kelp, hitting clams and mussels, and seeped into otter bloodstreams. A 2022 NOAA aerial photo showed California's coastline changing color from blue-green to cloudy gray. At first glance, it looked like seafoam, but in reality, it was biological residue where pathogens and waste met. Ironically, the very place humans believed was healed had become the birthplace of destruction. Tour guides still tell visitors, this is the animal that almost vanished because of its fur, now returned thanks to our compassion. But that story is outdated. The scarier question now is, are we creating a second extinction, this time not with guns, but with drains? The truth is, no one deliberately dumped poison into the sea. Yet, everyone contributed a little. Every household is a link in the chain. Every treatment plant is an open gate to the ocean. And within that seemingly clean network, nature has become the victim of human standards. A biologist at Oregon State once joked, we don't need to dump chemicals into the sea, just live normally, that's enough. It sounded sarcastic, but it might be truer than any official report. So the question isn't, why are otters dying, but how did it get this far without anyone noticing? Maybe when nature begins to fight back, it no longer roars, it goes silent, leaving us to watch the creatures we once saved dying along the same shores we still call safe. And that's when a new solution appeared, a multi-million dollar project promising to stop pollution at its source. But, like every plan ever praised before, it carried something familiar inside the belief that mankind can control the ocean. Number two, when America released the dream into the sea. As the number of dead sea otters rose with each season, people started looking for a way out. Meetings, reports, and rescue campaigns spread from San Diego to Sitka. The press called it the permanent cleanup, a phrase that sounded elegant, scientific, almost like a baptism for the ocean. 
And so, America began releasing something into the sea it believed would save it. A kind of synthetic super microbe, designed to destroy parasites, absorb toxic algae, and restore clarity to the water. It sounded like a technological miracle, much like the way people once spoke about DDT in the 1950s or plastic in the 1960s. This will change the world, and indeed, it did. The only question was in which direction. The first trial began off the coast of Oregon in 2019, covering about 40 square miles. Tons of engineered microbes were released from research vessels, dissolving into the ocean currents. In the first few months, the results were astonishing. Water became clearer, kelp began to grow again, and anchovy populations rebounded. The media celebrated. Officials posed for photos along the shore, declaring it a new era of active conservation. The public watched the news and felt reassured as if someone, somewhere, was taking care of the future for them. But the ocean story is never that simple. Something smaller than a grain of sand, seemingly harmless, began to multiply. The cells that were created to eat parasites started consuming anything with a similar structure, including sea urchin eggs, Eggs, crab larvae, and the liver cells of sea otters. When a scientist in Monterey brought a sample back to the lab, she realized what they had released hadn't disappeared, it was reproducing, it was adapting. And that was when things started to sound familiar. America's environmental history is filled with miracle fixes like this, from deliberately introducing bullfrogs to Hawaii, to control insects, to spraying rivers with chemicals to kill algae. Each began as a short-term success, then nature sent the bill. An environmental journalist once said, in America, Nothing spreads faster than a good idea that hasn't been tested. When the first reports showed otter deaths climbing again, officials insisted there's no direct evidence linking the microbial project to these incidents. And technically, they were right. But nature doesn't need proof, it only needs time. Within a year, the number of otters suffering brain infections caused by mutated parasites had tripled. Inside their livers, researchers found a strange cellular structure. Not toxoplasma, not bacteria, but something entirely new as if two enemies had merged into one. Some called it a lab error. Others were more blunt. It's what happens when humans release something they don't fully understand. A bioengineer from UC Santa Cruz once said during a symposium, half smiling, we talk about restoring ecosystems, but really we're just teaching the ocean to speak our language. It sounded arrogant, but it perfectly captured what was happening. An ocean no longer natural, but programmed to follow human logic. Yet, when things began to go wrong, no one dared to stop. Because once a project has funding, jobs, and the label green, admitting failure means admitting we can't control the sea. And in American politics, saying I can't control it is not something anyone wants to hear. So year after year, millions of gallons of ocean-friendly solution kept being released. The savior had turned into a slow killer. One evening, I told this story to a fisherman friend in Oregon over a beer. He shrugged and said, people have this weird habit. They think they're smarter than water simple words, but they carried a century of illusion. We once believed we could save forests by cutting down old trees. We believed we could stop floods by building dams. And now, we believe we can reprogram the ocean with artificial biology. What's frightening isn't the mistake itself, it's the quiet confidence behind it. So what exactly was released into the sea? A solution? Or a new form of risk? Did we create something beyond our understanding, something now rewriting the laws of survival beneath the Pacific? One thing is certain, nature never stays silent for long. Because soon after, the first signs of retaliation began to appear, a chain reaction no one could control. Three, when the ocean stopped speaking, it started with numbers so small that no one paid attention. A few otter carcasses washed ashore near Santa Cruz. A few water samples showed unusual traces. Officials called it a natural fluctuation. The press reported lightly, nothing to worry about. But within three months, the number of dead otters had quadrupled. More than half showed signs of internal bleeding and no one knew why. The wounds didn't resemble infection or parasites. They looked like a chemical reaction happening inside the body itself. Marine biologists at UC Davis called it internal decay syndrome. The term sounded both clinical and haunting. They believed the artificial microbes had interacted with heavy metals and ammonia molecules in wastewater, producing a secondary toxin, a chemical reaction, no one had anticipated. Each time it occurred, another creature died. And bitterly enough, what was created to save the ocean was now eating it away, piece by piece. Imagine this, every second, millions of microscopic organisms were dying, but what was really collapsing were the connections between them, like cutting one thread after another from a net until it finally tears. There was no explosion, no smoke, just a dense, spreading silence. A researcher in Monterey once said, the ocean is dying, but no one can hear it. The line spread through the scientific community like a confession. 
Fishermen noticed it first. Their nets came up filled with foam and dead shellfish. The color of the sea changed from deep blue to dull gray, then to pale violet. In Alaska, salmon vanished from coastal waters in just two weeks. Marine sanctuaries suspended operations. Some beaches even posted warnings, avoid direct contact with the water. It was the first time the phrase biological pollution was officially used to describe the aftermath of an ecological restoration project. The story was no longer about sea otters. It had become a slow motion film of an ecosystem unraveling. When the otters disappeared, sea urchins multiplied uncontrollably, devouring entire kelp forests, turning coastal waters into what scientists called biological deserts. Without kelp, the California coast lost its natural barrier against waves. Landslides doubled. Ocean view homes worth millions now stood dangerously close to the edge. Nature wasn't striking back with fury, it was retreating. People used to believe that when we harm nature, it gets angry. But the real terror comes when it doesn't, when it simply goes silent and withdraws. That's how the ocean fights back, by taking away the life we depend on. Some scientists began using a new phrase, the oceanic pandemic. It described the spread of mutated microbes that humanity could no longer control. It didn't kill people, so few paid attention but it was destroying the ecological foundation that human life depends on. One expert in Oregon remarked, half joking, this thing's more ethical than we are. It doesn't discriminate. It just does what it was made to do, destroy. It was the kind of irony no one wanted to hear. And it marked the moment America began to realize that in the battle to control nature, humanity may win technically, but lose existentially. The question now wasn't how do we stop it, but can we stop it? Because once a system replicates itself at the biological level, even pulling the plug means nothing. Nature had learned our language and was now using it against us. And like every tragedy, no one wanted to admit they were the main character. Agencies blamed data errors. Corporations called it a rare accident. Ordinary people stayed silent, unwilling to believe that a bottle of dish soap or a toilet flush could contribute to the death of the ocean. At a harbor bar in Newport, someone once raised the glass and said, we don't need war to destroy the world, just a little good intention in the wrong place. It sounded like a joke, but it was the most bitter truth of our time. And this was only the beginning of the domino effect. Because once the ocean falls out of balance, everything on land from climate to the economy will eventually pay the price. But who, in the end, will truly pay it? Four, the domino effect from sea to land. When the ocean falls into disorder, the reaction does not stop at the water. It spreads onto land like a fever the body has not yet recognized. The collapse of kelp forests drags down entire coastal economy. Places that once bustled with boats now hold only the sound of wind whistling through rusty masts. Seafood restaurants close. Fish prices have doubled, while supply has vanished. In Monterey, people joke that a bowl of clam chowder now costs more than a cocktail. It sounds funny, but it is the harsh truth of a region that once lived by the sea. As sea urchins overrun the coast, the seafloor turns into a bare graveyard. Without kelp, underwater oxygen drops sharply, microorganisms die off in huge numbers, and the carbon once held in place begins to seep into the atmosphere. One scientist in Oregon estimates that the Northern California coast alone is releasing an amount of carbon equal to 40 million cars each year, and people call it ecological damage a phrase that sounds like a financial term. The wording is ironic. Nature collapses and we still try to total it up. The fallout reaches public health. Storms grow stronger. The water grows dirtier. A gut bacterium Vibrio parahemolyticus begins showing up in frozen seafood in Alaska, something never seen there before. Health agencies report that food poisoning cases have tripled and, for the first time, admit that artificially clean seas are no longer safe for people. It is a direct slap at the long-standing belief that we can control nature with standards and filters. Fishermen, tourism, and entire coastal communities are pulled into the spiral. When the sea is sick, people lose work. When the otters disappear, the tourists disappear with them. A man in Eureka told a reporter, people used to come to see the otters, now they come to see the no swimming signs. And as in every cycle in America, when the economy weakens, we reach for recovery. That means another new project, another new budget, Another new promise wrapped in fine words like restoration, greening, and sustainability, like a bandage pressed over a wound that is still bleeding. This is the loop behind every ecological disaster. Each time nature reacts, we answer with another solution, like trying to put out a fire with gasoline simply because it is clear. Look closely and everything connects from a single drain in San Francisco to the Alaskan coast, from a family's dinner table to the ocean's breath. No one stands outside this story. 
Some will pay sooner, others will pay later. An old ecologist in Washington once said, the ocean is not angry, it is simply taking back what it gave. It sounds like a reminder meant for all of America that what we send into the sea will, sooner or later, return to shore. If this spiral does not stop, what will fall next? The economy, public health, or our very belief that we can still repair nature. Five, nature begins to rewrite the code of life. After the collapse spread onto land, people started talking about a counterattack. It was not a grand campaign, but scattered efforts, small scientific teams, coastal communities, and nature itself. In Alaska, something strange appeared. In a few areas, sea otters began to return even though the water was still polluted. Tissue samples showed a peculiar immune variant that could resist the new form of parasite. One biologist described it this way. It is as if nature is updating its own software. The line sounds scientific and chilling because, if true, it means the ocean is evolving to survive without us. Meanwhile, in California, conservation groups tried something different. They built natural filters using native species, kelp, mussels, and photosynthetic bacteria. Instead of pumping in chemical solutions, they let nature rebalance itself. Not because they were certain it would work, but because their faith in technology had run out. One engineer said, my job is no longer to fix the ocean, it is to learn how not to break it. It sounded like a confession, simple and true. Every approach has a price. As funding for nature-based projects shrank, many research groups had to seek money from the very corporations that had helped cause the damage. Another vicious circle began. To save nature, they had to rely on the same hands that had harmed it. Once again, the ocean became a stage for bargaining between ethics and profit. All the while, nature seemed to have its own plan. In waters once written off as dead off Oregon, new reefs began to appear. Ancient microorganisms gone for hundreds of years were detected again. Some scientists believe this is the ocean's immune system. When the damage lasts long enough, it creates new structures to survive. Others warn that what is growing may no longer be the ocean we knew. It has changed a new living system, colder, more adapted, and possibly no longer needing us. Even so, people keep trying. Small organizations, local communities, and coastal residents pick up trash, replant kelp, and rescue stranded otters caught in oil sheens. There are no cameras and no slogans, only the quiet work of those who understand that repair is no longer a privilege, it is a duty. They are not saving the sea for praise, but so they still have a place to live. One foggy afternoon in Bodega Bay, I met an old fisherman casting a net into the cold mist. He said, we used to think the sea was a mother. Now we understand that even mothers get tired. The words are gentle, but they hold a way to live. When we stop acting like owners, nature may stop acting like an avenger. The line between salvation and error is once again paper thin. What people call a counterattack may be nothing more than a way to comfort ourselves that we still have a chance. And perhaps, out in those darkening waters, the ocean has already chosen its own path. One that does not need apologies. Only time. Six, the ocean's invoice. When the Save the Sea projects wrapped up, the surface went quiet again. No more research vessels, no more press conferences, only soft waves and a few otters drifting in kelp as if nothing had happened. But everything had changed. The ocean is not what it was. It is simply watching in silence. Scientists call this a recovery phase, but look closely and it is not revival. It is rebirth, an ocean remade, carrying human fingerprints in every molecule. Kelp forests grow back, but thinner. Ancient microbes return and mingle with engineered variants. The otters that survive carry unusual antibodies, as if nature were adjusting its own genetic code without our help. Perhaps the ocean never grew angry? It simply remembers. It remembers what we released, what we forgot, then returns it on schedule. An oceanographer in Seattle once said, nature does not take revenge, it sends an invoice. The frightening part is that the invoice always arrives on time. Few of us read the fine print. Now people speak less about ecosystem restoration and more about living with consequences. In Monterey, an old fisherman said, we cannot save the sea. We just hope it will keep us a while longer. The line is plain, but it carries an awakening. The otters we once saved now stand for that lesson. They are not only victims, they are a mirror held up to us, showing how thin the line is between saving and controlling, like a film of water. They live on. But in a world we have changed for good. Some say it is a cycle. Others say it is the final warning. Either way, it forces us to ask whether we are truly saving nature or only buying a little more time before we are swept away. When the ocean starts to rewrite its own rules, people are no longer the storytellers. We are only characters in a larger script. And this time, we may not get to edit it. 